डायलिसिस हॉस्पिटल है बल्कि सबसे आधुनिक भी अल्ट्रा मॉडर्न भी कंप्लीटली हाईटेक भी और साथ में 100 परसेंट फ्री जी बिल्कुल आपने ठीक सुना क्रॉनिक किडनी डिजीज अफेक्ट्स मिलियंस वर्ल्ड वाइड कुड हाइपोबारिक ऑक्सीजन थेरेपी ऑफर बीकन ऑफ होप Stage one CKD means you have mild kidney damage and an EGFR of 90 or greater. Most of the time, an EGFR value of 90 or greater means your kidneys are healthy and working well. But you have other signs of kidney damage. Signs of kidney damage could be protein in your urine or physical damage to your kidneys. Stage two CKD means you have mild kidney damage and an EGFR between 60 and 89. Stage 2 signs of kidney damage could be protein in your urine or physical damage to your kidneys. Stage 3 CKD means you have an EGFR value between 30 and 59. This means that there is some damage to your kidneys and they are not working as well as they should. Many people in stage 3 kidney disease do not have symptoms, but if there are symptoms, there may be swelling in your limbs, back pain and urinating more or less than normal. To keep your stage three kidney disease from getting worse, you can take general measures and visit a nephrologist who will make a treatment plan that is right for you. Stage four CKD means you have an EGFR value between 15 and 29. This means your kidneys are moderately or severely damaged and are not working as they should. Stage four kidney disease should be taken very seriously as it is the last stage before kidney failure. At stage 4 kidney disease many people have symptoms such as swelling in your limbs back pain and urinating more or less than normal at this stage you will likely also have health complications as waste builds up in your body and your kidneys are not working well stage 5 or the final stage of ckd means that you have an egfr value less than 15 this means that your kidneys are getting very close to failure or have completely failed if your kidneys fail waste builds up in your blood which makes you very sick You will also have multiple symptoms such as muscle cramps, falling sick, loss of appetite, swelling, back pain, urinating more or less than normal, trouble breathing, insomnia, and many more complications. Once in the fourth stage, kidney function has declined severely. Symptoms can be more pronounced and may include nausea, taste changes, and loss of appetite. At this stage, preparation for renal replacement therapy, such as dialysis or a kidney transplant, begins. Finally, we arrive at stage 5, also known as end-stage kidney disease. Here, the kidneys have lost nearly all their function. Symptoms can be severe and may require hospitalization. Treatment options are dialysis or a kidney transplant. What And the inner surface is concave. The inner surface has a deep notch. Here you can see the ureter, renal artery and renal vein entering the kidney through this notch. A fibrous capsule surrounds the kidney. Inside the kidney there are two zones, the cortex and the medulla. The cortex is a reddish brown layer of tissue below the capsule, whereas Medulla is a form of pale conical shaped striations. The main function of the kidneys is to remove waste products and excess water from the blood. The kidney does it with the help of tiny filters present in it. These filters are called nephrons. The cortex and medulla together comprise millions of such nephrons. all packed together the nephron is the structural and functional unit of a kidney each nephron consists of a renal corpuscle and a renal tubule a renal corpuscle is composed of two structures a tangled cluster of blood capillaries called glomerulus and a thin walled sac like structure called the bowman's capsule which surrounds the glomerulus the glomerulus is actually a miniature filtering or sieving device which consists of a tightly coiled network at the heart of each kidney lies the nephron the functional unit responsible for filtering blood within each nephron is the glomerulus a tiny yet vital 
network of capillaries enclosed within Bowman's capsule. This structure acts as the primary filtration barrier, allowing water in small solutes to pass while retaining larger molecules like proteins and blood cells. Glomerular filtration produces a plasma-like filtrate containing waste, but also water and other substances the body needs. As the filtrate passes out of the glomerular capsule and through the renal tubule, substances like water, essential ions, glucose, amino acids, and proteins are reabsorbed into the body through cells along the tube wall. At the same time, additional waste ions and hydrogen ions still in the blood pass from capillaries into the renal tubule. This process is called secretion. This process In CKD, the glomerular filtration barrier suffers damage due to factors like infections, viral or bacterial, high blood pressure and diabetes. This damage compromises the filtration barrier, leading to leakage of proteins, proteinuria, and red blood cells, hematuria, into the urine, early indicators of kidney dysfunction. The leaked proteins from the damaged glomeruli are reabsorbed by the tubular cells, leading to their activation and the release of inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, and growth factors. This cascade results in the accumulation of extracellular matrix components like collagen and fibronectin in the interstitial space, leading to fibrosis, a scarring process that further impairs kidney function. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy, or HPOT, involves breathing pure oxygen in a pressurized environment. This therapy enhances oxygen delivery to tissues, promoting healing and reducing inflammation. Notably, HPOT stimulates the mobilization of stem cells, which can home in on and repair damaged tissues, including those in the kidneys. Clinical studies have shown that HPOT can significantly reduce proteinuria. In one study involving diabetic patients, the number of individuals without detectable protein in their urine increased from 30% to 57% after HBOT sessions. This suggests that HBOT aids in repairing the glomerular filtration barrier, preventing the leakage of proteins and red blood cells into the urine. While HBOT shows promise in restoring the glomerular barrier, its impact on serum creatinine and estimated glomerular filtration rate, EGFR, appears limited in the short term. This may be because, although the filtration barrier is repaired, the overall filtering capacity of the kidneys requires more extensive regeneration, particularly of the tubular structures. HBOT-induced stem cell mobilization plays a crucial role in kidney repair. These stem cells can differentiate into various cell types, aiding in the regeneration of damaged glomerular and tubular structures, potentially restoring kidney function over time. The stem cells in the blood use a method called homing in the blood capillaries to find a trouble spot and gets planted via the wall of the blood capillary. Fortunately the, the blood capillaries are there in the CKD kidney in the glomerulus and the tubules of millions of nephrons in the HBOT produced stem cells can enter the kidneys for repair at ease. When I was studying the literature if HBOT will cure CKD or not, the AI suggested that the HBOT cured protein urea and RBC in urine. But I was made to understand that the 60 days HBOT treatment on patients with foot ulcer could cure proteinuria and hematuria but could not cure creatinine that remained unchanged after HBOT, so you need dialysis. How is that feat even possible through these two mechanisms? In the graphical form, look at this. From 80 to 180, you will have a constant GFR. This is this is autoregulation. This is autoregulation. Okay, as we discussed, the first mechanism of GFR regulation is the myogenic mechanism. As the word indicates, myogenic. Myo means muscle, the smooth muscle of vessels. Genic means response uh, to something, all right? So it's the response of the smooth muscles of the arterioles uh, of the vessels inside the kidney uh, such that in a way that GFR remains constant.
and look at this uh, the cells that are facing the afferent and the efferent arteriole they are the uh, macula densa and then the cells of the visceral uh, smooth muscle of the afferent arteriole and the efferent but more on the afferent side they specialize to become the jg cells okay this is important this whole thing here macula densa plus jg cells of the afferent and yes the efferent they form the juxta glomerular apparatus okay juxta glomerular apparatus okay so we were discussing uh, tg balance tubular glomerular feedback mechanism uh, this is a continuation of this diagram and my discussion on jg apparatus tubular glomerular balance basically this graph uh, this uh, flow chart so look at the scenario so the arterial blood pressure they say uh, say it uh, decreases okay um, this will result in glomerular hydrostatic pressure to drop if the glomerular hydrostatic pressure to drop this is we are assuming no auto regulation uh, is taking place all right so if in case of no auto regulation there's a free fall or you drop the arterial pressure all sorts of problems come uh, to the hydrostatic pressure it drops as well and since this is the main determinant of the gfr the gfr goes down and now what happens <clears throat> when the gfr goes down uh, this is the signal that macula densa then gives the jg cells if i just uh, take you back to the diagram this so this is the tubular fluid that has arrived which is deficient in sodium chloride macula densa picks this up and when macula densa picks it up uh, it gives the signal to its very nearby cousins the jg cells so the signal goes to the jg cells that look sodium chloride is less okay there must be something wrong with gfr jg cells of the afferent and some of the efferent mainly the afferent they start secreting renin the ras renin angiotensin aldosterone system ras directly affects the kidneys by regulating the tone of renal blood vessels angiotensin 2 can cause vasoconstriction in the kidney potentially leading to decreased blood flow in glomerular filtration the ras can also influence tissue growth and repair in the kidney both beneficial and detrimental the ras can also contribute to fibrosis scarring and inflammation in the kidney further impairing its function before hbot the ckd kidney has damaged glomerulus membrane with holes to let proteins and rbc into urine also the kidneys are scared creatinine levels are very high the auto regulation of constant gfr in the following three mechanisms in the kidney failed myogenic response tubular glomerular feedback third mechanism this third mechanism is less understood but may involve factors like adenosine which is released in response to decreased oxygen supply to the kidney causing afferent arteriole constriction and a decrease in gfr after hbot 60 days treatment 2 to 2.4 ata the ckd kidney's damaged glomerulus membrane got repaired and the membrane holes were closed not to let proteins and rbc into urine but more cure needs to be done one to bring creatinine levels in blood back to normal two to remove scar on the kidneys three the auto regulation of constant gfr and the following three mechanisms are to be restored myogenic response tubular glomerular feedback third mechanism hbot healing took time 6 months for foot ulcer it will take more time to heal the otherwise not curable ckd kidneys similar to the non curable foot ulcer hbot pressure 2.5 ata time equals 6 months ஒரு ஆரோக்கியமா இப்ப வந்து பேசிட்டு இருக்க இருக்க அப்படி சொன்னா அதுக்கு வந்து காரணமே நான் வேற ஒரு ஹாஸ்பிடல் பேர் சொல்ல விரும்பல அங்க வந்து கிட்னி இந்த प्रॉब्लमல மல்டிபிள் प्रॉब्लम्स கிட்னி प्रॉब्लम மெயின் அங்க இருக்கும்போது அங்க ட்ரீட்மென்ட் வந்து அவ்வளவு வந்து சரியா இருந்தீங்கல எனக்கு வந்து ஒரு டவுட் வந்த பிறகு தி பெஸ்ட் ஒன் ஆஃப் தி பெஸ்ட் டாப் நெஃப்ரோலஜிஸ்ட் இன் आवर कंट्री தெரிஞ்சது அவங்க என்னுடைய பெஸ்ட் ஃப்ரெண்ட் வந்து சாரி இன்ட்ரோ듀ஸ் பண்ணாங்க கன்க்ளூஷன் HBOT is not a miracle cure for CKD now but it offers a promising avenue for kidney regeneration by repairing the glomerular filtration barrier reducing interstitial fibrosis and potentially restoring autoregulatory mechanisms 
HBOT provides hope for CKD patients seeking alternatives to dialysis and transplantation.